Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mind Your Mental. Just a reminder that this podcast is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. I know they are hard to find, and I get that. I have a bunch of resources on my website if you need them, but I am not your clinician. I am a psychologist, but I am not your psychologist. So if you need any specific help, please look for the help of a licensed mental health professional. Learn all you can learn from the podcast. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to Mind Your Mental. Today we have Bridget Kelly, New York City born, Grammy Award winning artist and the inaugural signee to Jay-Z's Rock Nation label, who also discovered her voice early. I love hearing the voice in the first place. Beyond her successful music career, she has hosted Red Carpets BET, appeared on TV shows for VH1 and Fuse, and has previously co-hosted the popular podcast series, See the Thing Is. Currently, she's involved in producing and launching other content series and podcasts like for better or best. How are you yes. doing? I'm so good. So good. Basking in my newlywed bliss. Yes. I see you still rock. really you rock, loving you. You rocking that white too? You just got I married? I am. I'm still... Still and still feeling like I need to just be in, in my bridal in my bridal glory right now. I just need to be Do it. just completely exuding the bride life. That's exactly where I'm at. Yeah. yeah very much so. When, so this past, so our semester is wrapping up at TSU where I'm a professor, but we, we did like a mental health hip hop and activism class at the Love request that. of my students because I teach like the black experience and I'm just like we always do like a section on hip hop, but it never felt yeah. long enough. And I'm like Yo, I could do a whole mm. course on this. Like this could eat You really could. Course. You really could. <laughs> no, you really could. And if you decide to go virtual at any point, like I know plenty of people who would love to participate in that. Love to. It really was awesome. To. And I was just like, oh, I gotta I gotta have Bridget on the show because when I be when I was listening to your podcast, like love the perspective. When we were talking earlier, I was like, I will tell you, one of the biggest things I heard from my students is like they were like, Yeah, it's not the same. So like we started off early. One of the things yeah. they said it in the beginning, like old school, old school hip hop, like them's the break, that's the breaks and stuff like that. They were like, these songs are too long. I'm not, I'm not mm. listening to all of this. Mm. And right. Then, like, and I'm like, okay, okay. But then as we transition and I'm like, okay, so what do you feel like your messages are when it comes to mental health and hip hop? And a lot of them were like, generationally, I feel like our generation has lost its way. They, mm-hmm. they were like, there are no messages. They acknowledge that? They good did. That's why I'm saying. Good for them. Yes. Good for them. <laughs> because good for them. I'm like, we did presentations the other day and they did hip hop artists and they did Lauren Hill. One of, one of the groups did Lauren Hill. And it was so funny because one of the students was just like, you know, she was standing in her truth, which is really hard because they were like, she wasn't showing her body. She wasn't being explicit. And then at the end, she, they was like, she just wasn't being nasty for real. You know what I'm saying? And I was just cracking up because... <laughs> Because the class was like, I was like, nasty though? She was like, you know, you know, she just wasn't being nasty and she still made it happen. But they were very open about being like, I don't know, Dr. Martin, it's, it's, I don't know, man. I don't, it's not the same as like, if we, if we compare from where it came to now, it's just not the same. But they also mentioned like, you know, we just try to have a good time. And I'm like, right, right. But what do you think the original goal of hip hop was? You know, because no one was having a great time. <laughs> okay. Like we very much were no. being listened to but they would listen to the music and i'm like so they, it, it was interesting because most of the time you know i feel like they feel like stuff is being taken out on them but they were like we ain't got no voice for real we like to party make money get turned like yeah mm-hmm. yeah life has thrown different things at them in that generation and i i mean yeah. i feel i feel for them because i think we have i think we have had we've had a, a very unique experience right mm-hmm. in in coming from a whole generation of boomers who very followed everything pretty much by the book, by rote, and it worked out for them. Economically, it also worked out for them. And then my my generation, our generation, was the internet generation that was where it was introduced to us, but we were already we were already kind of on a track to follow some of the same sort of ideologies that our our the our parents and our our grandparents followed. Mm-hmm. And so I just I think that this generation now, I wouldn't say they're lost. I just think they have a different idea of what they want their future to look like and what the options actually are. I think my generation was probably the last group that was like, okay, we have to go to college. And then we all went to, and then everybody went to college and it was like, well, now, now we're in a recession. So (laughs) there's no job. So now we're all qualified to be living at home and not have jobs. And so, you know, the generations that followed have had really unique opportunities to get involved in tech and be a part of all of these different evolutions that of science and everything else that, 
really encourage self-employment and entrepreneurship and individualism. I think individualism has, has kind of cemented itself in this new generation in a way that it's kind of a double-edged sword. It works, it works in some instances, but then as we watched with, you know, the worldwide pandemic, yeah. it didn't work as well in other instances. So I feel for them, but I think it's cool that they can they can take accountability for the fact that like well, we just want to have a good time. Like we don't really want to have to be serious and have to think about versus my generation of at 21, everybody was like, You're an adult now. You have to you have to be responsible. You have to yeah. buy a house. You gotta get married. You gotta have a career. You gotta be all of those kind of like benchmark things that we 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 planned on and we set out to accomplish this younger generation is like we don't need to do that <laughs> you don't need that yeah. i just want to be out near yeah, glow i just want to be in a parking lot like right I and i feel like thing. i can do both i remember we were doing we were talking about i talk about liberation psych right which is meant to be like the psych mm-hmm. of the masses and i was like oh let's play some songs that represent that and I was like, one of the things, like, one of the songs I, I played, like Ronald Reagan, and I was playing like Killer Mike. And they were like, Dr. Martin, is this what you drive down the street listening to? Not the judgment. And I was Mm-mm. like, yeah, like, you know, Rage Against the Machine. They were like, oh my gosh, Dr. Martin, you ever just want to. <laughs> This is like, this Mike's like, album was great. That's so disrespectful. Yo, I said, this album is a great. great album, yo. Like, y'all are tripping. I was like, this album was amazing. They're like, I know, but like, I thought you said you like Megan Thee Stallion. I said, I do as well, but like, okay. time and place. There's a time and a time place, and place, y'all. And, mm-hmm. and the thing is, for them, it's always a time and place. And I'm just like, yo, like, mm-hmm. I mean, if we're talking about messaging and we're talking about activism, there's a reason, like, there's mm-hmm. a difference in messaging and a lot of times I'm asking questions like all right so you guys can acknowledge that it's different but you can also acknowledge that there are still problems so where is the message supposed to come from right when when we're kind of voiced the problems and stuff like that and you're someone who's been in the music scene for a significant amount of time and you're at very you've been at different levels as like an artist and as a producer and you're Mm -hmm. interviewing people do you what do you see as like the most significant change in terms of the messaging with artists, like, is it a, is it, I think previously it's like, it's more of a safe place to talk about police brutality and, you know, activism and mental health, but like the messaging, I'm gonna be honest, it does seem to be like, like, it's like one lane. I feel like I'm hearing the same thing all the time. Yeah. And even with hearing about activism and all that other stuff previously in music, we we're taught, they were talking about issues, but it just at least sounded different. I, I genuinely feel like I'm hearing the same thing all the time. And I'm like, yeah. This doesn't interest me. I'm playing the same Spotify because every time I hear something new, I'm like, I don't like it. You're like, is this it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this is it? This is all we got in this playlist? Okay. All right. I guess. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I think, I think social media is really the main component that kind of dictates culturally where we stand yeah. on different yeah. views, right? I think, especially over the last like four years and watching, I won't even say four years, I'll go a step further and say probably, probably the last seven or eight years, mm-hmm. we've kind of watched a shift in number one in politics. I think, you know, politi- the political administrations have really abuse social media and and the media in a way that has forced them to kind of pick a side around 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 political around political and social issues which i think for the most part hip hop has always has always been on the side of telling the truth about uh, about stories and about generations that have been suppressed and 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 the populations that have been suppressed and and also oppressed and so i think i think social media now everybody is so bombarded by so many different outlets that sorting through misinformation is, is a task in itself, right? And also figuring out based on who is, who is the most popular on social media, finding an artist that you resonate with yeah. versus listening to what your neighbor is listening to or going outside and hearing what somebody is playing in their car. That's not how people are discovering music now. So they're discovering who's hot on TikTok. Yeah. That's how a lot of label execs are finding artists is who's playing, who's music, who's going viral, who's playing music, who has the most followers, the most engagement. So it's not about the artistry necessarily. It's really about the presentation and the marketability of something based on social media insights. So I think that's probably the most major component that's, that's made a difference. But I also think that that impacts the messaging too, because, you know, if we're talking about hip hop and we're talking about you know, who is, who is an unbelievable lyricist who's going to tell you an incredible story that most, most people could relate to. Rhapsody is one of those people. Yeah. Rhapsody reminds me a lot of Lauryn Hill, right? But then you have someone like a Tierra Whack who also embodies 
sort of the vivid, br bold, bright colors that Missy Elliott and the imagery that Missy Elliott embodied at a certain yeah. point, right? That was a lot more fun, but similar messaging, right? Mm -hmm. I just think social media plays a part in who people relate to and, and what people aspire to be, because I think ultimately the aspiration is the same, right? We think about artists that we grew up listening to for Lauryn Hill and for, for those of us that listened to Lauryn Hill growing up, we wanted to be seen, we wanted yeah. to be heard. For this new generation to be seen and heard means you got to go viral on the internet. It means that that's how you're seen and heard. So yeah. finding an artist that can do that and is speaking to your experience is how the kids are doing it. And I feel like that's tough because I'm going to be honest, some of my favorite artists I've listened to it for a minute. I don't know if they're as big on social media. Like for, well, to a certain extent, like Tierra Whack and No Name and Dochi. And like, those are some of my favorites. And even like, I, I find myself more so gravitating towards alternative stuff. Like one of the, one of the students did a presentation on Tyler, the creator. And there was some, somebody was like, I've never heard of Tyler, the creator. And the entire, like darn near the whole class, like gasped. It was like, <gasps> how could you not? What? Yeah. So, Right. Um, so when we were talking about like the, and I think it's also like, they're so used to having access to so many things. Um, yeah. And then I, I was like, if we're talking about transition, we got to talk about the aspect of commercialization because now it's the aspect of like, people are getting into music to make money. But I was like, yo, you could have been at a party listening to somebody rock it. And then they working at the, the, the chicken joint, like on Monday and they'd be like, that's right here. I'm working. What you mean? There's no money in this. This is just what I, this is my art. Like people were listening to, the music before they would listen to like actual activists talking about it. Right. Like there are people who right. be like, Oh, that NWA album. I wonder if there was actual a, a legit issue with police brutality. And it's like, yeah, we got activists talking about this all day, but you put it to a beat and people will listen to it. I think that right. this is something that's also different because I always, anytime I think about music, all I hear is that, that what it was some documentary with Beyonce. And she said, people don't make albums anymore. And when I like, I used, I need to be able to play it from beginning to end. I like an interlude. Love an interlude. Love an oh. interlude. Anything that's transitional, anything yes. that goes from one song to the next seamlessly, musically, it all it all flows together. Yeah, oh, I love that. No, I'm I'm with you on that. And Definitely I'll be listening that. to stuff and I'll be like, I mean, I mean, I remember, I kid you not, when I, I used to think the single was typically like not even the best song on the album. It was just the one that she oh, could always. like dance to more. Now I'm yeah. like, oh well, this is the best song on the album, I guess. Like, I don't is this what are we? It's a great three second dance, but like, can I, I, I need right. to actually listen to the song. Like, and I just think it's very, there's yeah. still more artists coming out and my students have very much taught me about it. But as someone who very much leaned into the aspect of music is like mental health and expression and people are like normalizing experiences. Yeah. I don't know. Part of it is, I don't know. Part of it is, I, I don't want to keep listening to the same albums, but they got to give me some better stuff because... What am I, what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? Like, I like what I like. My husband legit was like, I was like, oh, I'm gonna play some music. He said, I mean, are we listening to Aretha or College Dropout? Or are we listening to, he's like, how many times are you gonna play the same songs? And I'm like, first of all, you don't know me. Okay. I'm also at that. I'm also As at I that point in my life. I'm putting on, the, <laughs> putting on the same, I listen to the same, probably the same five albums all the time. Like there's just, it just, that's how I, I feel you. I feel you on that. I, Tyler, the creator is one of them. Like that's an album that gets a lot of play. Big yes. Crit is another one that gets a lot of play in our household. I just, I, the part that's disheartening for me is the, is the, the very, very clear and distinct disconnect between activists and activism and musicians yeah. and artists. I think there's just a huge gap between them. And I don't, I don't know necessarily why I think, Someone that's that's as politically vocal as a killer Mike is a great example of someone that's trying to go against the grain in that way. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I, I think I think some of that gets undermined then by this belief or this stigma around wanting to be a celebrity politician or a celebrity activist versus yeah. really be a spokesperson. I think we we kind of it's unfortunate, but I think we have we've been conditioned to play respectability politics a little bit when it comes to like and this false modesty and kind of like self-righteousness around like well if we're doing if we're really doing this for the people then we can't be rich and be famous and be you know what i mean it's yeah. kind of i i think when we get we start to get into that kind of weird pettiness it it totally undermines the mission of really trying to number one provide adequate information for the the upcoming generations that are that need to learn that need to understand how their vote 
actually impacts things on a local level and then on a federal level, yeah. right? Like, I think understanding all of that, it doesn't, as much access as we have, there is also an agenda that is constantly in motion to silence a lot of the adequate and, and accurate information that we're, that is, that is trying to be funneled into the youth. Right. And mm -hmm. so I think, I, I think it's, it's hard to watch. Right. And knowing activists too, you know, knowing activists like D Ray or my homegirl Ole, who's also a, an attorney, she's a public defender in New York and she's amazing. She's the one who went after Eric Adams, Mayor Eric Adams on the breakfast club. Love yeah, her. That was, you hilarious. know what I mean? <laughs> someone like an Amanda, right? Someone like an Amanda Seals who's gonna call it like she sees it immediately. Yeah. Like, I think these are these are people that that have an unnecessary urgency in their messaging and in their voice. But I don't know if they necessarily reach the masses, whether if they're if they're not likable or if they're not popular or if their present their presentation is not fun or lighthearted or if it's always serious, if it's always passionate, I just, I think kind of excited that we're watching so many students now, you know, use their voice and use the power of their numbers in solidarity with their, with their protest against the genocide happening in Palestine, yeah. watching that in real time to see that passion manifest itself that way kind of gives me hope a little bit too, like in knowing that like, yo, you have the power in your hands to make a decision about what you what, what kind of footprint you want to leave on this earth for your generation and also the generations after yours. So I don't know. I wonder if I wonder if artists if artists care enough anymore the way that they did before. I don't know if they do. I don't I can't think of very many that are are interested in expressing themselves in a way that's different than just having fun because real life is so hard now. So maybe maybe that is kind of the point of wanting to just have fun. It's like Real life is really, it's devastating. Like real life is, is real yeah. life is hard. Yeah. Like it's really a struggle. Like, do we need to, do we need to continue to, to push that in music or is that putting it, is that putting a hat on a hat? You know what I mean? I don't know if that's. See, I struggle with that because honestly, when I was talking to my students and we're, we're talking about it in class and as someone who, the biggest thing that I loved about hip hop is that it was the voice of people that look like me and the mm -hmm. messaging in it was honestly akin to the books I was reading, right? So it really was just, mm. it's like, it, it was what I was used to reading. Like I'm from Philly and I grew up very, very pro-black, right? So like, I liked the music because the music was just like the books. Like, you know, like it was, it was, it was similar to the pro-black books I was reading. And a lot of, I was talking to my students about like, we asked questions about when can you separate the art from the artist, right? Like mm. we were talking about, they, we were talking, we talked about different artists, like talked about R. Kelly. And of course we talked about Diddy, but I was like, I, I gave, I was like, we talked about African Bombada and we talked, and I was just like, so when do we separate the art from the artist? And then we got into a conversation about, okay, so what's the, what's the, if they're, if the goal is like, you're putting out art and this is just something that you're good at, why, why should there be a responsibility to talk about different things like why can't it just be about fun and I honestly it was a lot of back and forth because part of my class is like well because that's what it was brought up like this is what our class is about the history of this this is what it was the messaging was a way to advocate for us and they're like okay yeah but also like what about the fact that everything is so hard and we just want to have fun like why should why should they have to like where's the line and I was like I don't know y'all I think I'm too old for this conversation because like I, I very much do think there should be a responsibility, but I also get the aspect of having fun. It's hard because that's not what, what mental health, the, the, the whole aspect of hip hop, yes, it was started as, a, as like music and stuff, but there was always a message. Like there was always advocacy. Absolutely. Is it too much to expect that like, that, that's still there? Because let's say like one of the things that's contributing to the detriment of the black community, let's talk about drugs or whatever. One of my students was like, they were talking about drugs, but they were talking about it from a different perspective. They weren't saying like, oh, <laughs> this is all amazing. I'm doing drugs every five seconds. They were like, oh, yes, I did sell drugs. It was awful. And I contributed to the detriment community in that way. But he, they're like, now all they say is, oh, drugs are great. Drugs are great. Like, I'm, I'm high when I'm doing this lyric now. Like, lean. Yeah. I can't do a lyric without lean. I can't. And they're like, they're, yes, they were both talking about drugs, but it's not the same way. It's like. We right. can't deny that, like, yes, it's always been discussed, but there's been a change. Like, there's been a shift. The number of songs yeah. that I hear that I genuinely feel like are advocating for assault, like, I'd be like, yo, like, I mean, as someone, I ain't got a problem with raunchy. Like, I, I grew up in Lil' Kim, but this is not that. This is no, crazy. Like, they, they said she did what? They said they stuffed what in whose mouth? I'm sorry, what? Even though she said no? What? What are we talking about? Like, it's... 
there, I feel like a line has been crossed. And if we understand that the music impacts the community, is like, is it the fact that the music is representative of the time? And it's just like, these are, of course, these are issues. Or is it also mm-hmm. like people are faking it? And some people legit think this is real, right? Like, because my students, will, they'll be in the class and they're like, we all know that they're lying. And I'm like, y'all know that they're lying. But when I tell right. you that you guys are like 18 to 21, I have younger, I have patients that are younger and they literally think that like, this is their real life. Like, this is what they do. So yeah. like, where, where's the line? Like, I just, I'm just like, man, I don't know. I think this is crazy. How long are we supposed to act like this isn't an issue? I'm not saying everyone has to be a role model, but I don't know. I, 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 I'm starting to be like, I don't know if I can turn on the radio anymore. Cause I, I feel like I need to call the cops on somebody. <laughs> I think there's not call the cops or, 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 or call 911 because everybody's on drugs. Everybody's you, on it, drugs. Like what? What which, are you doing? Which I, I mean, that was, that was new to me. When I got in the music industry, I was like, wait, everybody's doing drugs. Y'all all do drugs. This is I a regular this, thing. I, saw I don't want to do joke drugs. That said, man, more people do cocaine than you know. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? More people do cocaine than you know. I, I was shocked. <laughs> No, I was shocked. When I moved to LA, I was shocked at how normal it was. Like I, and I've never tried it, never been interested in it. No judgment to anybody who has, but I, it's a, you, it's a way of life. Choices get made. I think to your point though, there is, there is room for both. Mm -hmm. I think there's room for both. I think we, I think there has to be room for both. We have to make room for both. I do. But mainly because at the end of the day, everyone, every artist is not going to represent everybody. Right. Yeah. And so I think, I think the way to kind of blend those two is to one, stop having the generational hip hop debates. Cause we're, I'm watching it happen in real time now, now even with yeah. this beef between Kendrick and J Cole and Drake. And you know what I mean? It's like yeah. to watch, I mean, and J Cole's not in it no more. J Cole said, y'all got it. I'm gonna go ride my bike. And, and I respect him kids. for it. <laughs> like, like, listen, I, I ain't got time for this. I, I, I I'm gonna go be, I'm gonna go be, I'm gonna go be a dad, a husband, and mind my business. Yeah. And <laughs> y'all got it. And I think, I think that's great because he's a human being, right? Yeah. But even the discourse around that and around even the the sportsmanship of hip hop, right, and the competitiveness and yeah. and sort of what that was founded on, I think we're now watching the conversation has now gone from, you know, discussing the actual art form. And the and how beautiful it is to watch two really incredibly talented artists compete with each other. To now, who can, who can, who can take the lowest blows? Who can be the nastiest to each other? like that for the the sake of the for the the criteria to now be that instead of really just highlighting the talent. Now we're highlighting the the power of the discourse and the power of the of the beef, not of the actual skills and the lyrics to me is kind of, it's a little cringe, but it also lets me know, like, at least we know the power of hip hop is still very ever, it's still front facing. It's still ever present because everyone's talking about it. Yeah. I just think it's a matter of finding, finding moments and and ways to kind of, you know, take someone like a killer Mike, who's like, yo, let's, I want to, I want to work with sexy red. I want to do stuff with Glorilla. I want to do stuff with Flo Millie. Like I want to find these young girls who are, who are just having fun, a lotto. You know what I'm saying? I These young these women who yeah. who have the game on lock, but who are also having a good time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And really kind of bridge that gap. I think that responsibility falls on the older generation. It just does. And the more yeah. conversations we have around it where it's kind of this punching down of like, well, these kids don't know anything about, it's like, yo, we can't keep dismissing and disregarding an experience that's unfamiliar to us just because we can't relate. Cause the bottom line is everybody, everyone who looks up to the artists who are on drugs suffer from the same, the no. same depression, the same issues, the same insecurities that we suffered from. We just listened to a different artist. We didn't have a Cuddy or a Travis Scott, right? Yeah. Like we were listening to different artists. So I think we still have to validate those artists and the experiences that they've had because they're still speaking to a whole generation that is going through it. Yeah. The kids are going through it. Everybody's going through it. Everybody's going through it. And I think the biggest issue is that like, like the same way you mentioned, like the aspect of showing like the power within the colleges. One of the things I always tell my students is like, don't let anybody ever tell you that like y'all don't have a voice because y'all have more days ahead of you than we do. And I say, anyone Absolutely. who tries to tell you that youth doesn't have a voice, they're trying to, they're, they're trying to convince themselves because y'all do have a voice. And when the <laughs> students are going back and forth, they go back and forth for a 
lot, but about the aspect of, we were talking about sexual liberation and lyrics and they, they went to old school. They were like, oh, you know, Lauren Hill. And they said like, me, Simone. And I was like, well, that's not, you know, it's all artists, but I was like, and you know, you can also talk about Megan Thee Stallion and you can also, I said, you can talk about all of these artists and for people who state that it's not for them. Well, you're not the, you're not the textbook demographic. Not everything's going to be for everybody, but you can't invalidate right. that that's not someone's experience. Even mm -hmm. when people are talking about the aspect of like discussing drugs and stuff like that, I just want some aspect of a balance because it's like, all right. Yeah. If you want to talk about like the, the good of drugs, I want to hear you talk about the bad too, yo. Like if you want to talk yeah. about what it's like being high, I want you to tell me about what it's like when you hit them lows. Like, I just want to hear all of it. Right. Because all of it is representative. So it's just like, yeah, I want to hear you talking about shaking your ass. Cause like, that's amazing. That's what I want to do too. But I also want to talk good about time. I guess a good time. You know, if I listen, listen, if I'm getting ready to go to the club, Nina Simone is great, but not, not today, not right now. Right. You know, right. I want to hear yes, yeah, true. You see what I'm saying? Like, yes, I want to listen to Killer Mike, but I'm also going to listen to R&B by Young Dolph. Like, I, I, I'm listening to all of this, but I want to hear all of it, you know? And I think one of the things that always stresses me out is I'm just like, all y'all talking about is the highs. You ain't going to tell me ain't no lows with drug use, yo. Like, even when I'm as a clinician, I used to, I would be in training with someone and they would be like, okay, so we have to talk about not using anything and total 100% reduction. And we just going to talk about the bads of drug use. And I'm like... And we just not going to acknowledge that people use drugs for a reason. You think they continue to do it because they always feel bad? I used to be like, in training. Because it's there? We just, there. we just decided to drink lean because it's there? No. Yo, <laughs> you got to make it. I you got to mix it. Gotta, like, <laughs> like y'all just really folk. Y'all, this cannot be the future clinicians. Y'all really think that all you're going to talk about is abstinence with substances? You will only talk about the negatives. You're not going to acknowledge that there's clearly a positive with using drugs. Like, it used to, like, literally... Being in training, I would be like, this is crazy. Y'all ain't never going to work with people that look like me because y'all lying. You're not, oh, well, drugs are all bad. Okay, well, mm -hmm. if you literally want to talk about substances, there's clearly some positives to drugs or they wouldn't keep using them. We can't expect right. someone to take you seriously if you're just being like, well, there are no positives with drugs. They don't make you feel good. Um, they don't make stuff a little bit more fun. You just need to stop right. them because they're bad for you. I would literally be right. like, I'm being pumped in all my training classes. Cause like, I would be like you. So we just expect them to just stop because it's bad for their health. Right. They know it's bad for their health. They also know, they've you been, know, they've been told that their whole, lives, they've been but... their whole lives. I just want the, I'm just like, I want the whole story. And when it comes to hip hop, I want the whole story. Like whenever they try to invalidate youth, I'm like, yo man, like you, this is always like a generational mm -hmm. thing, but you can't acknowledge yeah. that, like, okay, like, oh, you know, I don't want to see them naked. We'll turn it off, yo. Like, it's you, you turned it on. Like, maybe it's not for you. Maybe we just need to hear the whole story because it is just like you mentioned, it's representative of mental health. What music and the art always shows the emotions of the time period. So the fact that Absolutely. like we're talking so much about drug use and they're talking about drug use and and sex and they're talking about some people legit clearly don't know what consent is. That's and I mean, abuse and abuse. abuse there's abuse up and through all up and through it yeah that's indicative of the time so it's just like hmm i think this is a i think we gotta talk about this right like well drugs are a lot of times they're numbing behaviors what are can we acknowledge the fact that these they're having a diff difficult time and they need a reason to party i just saw something that said that it's the same generation that lost their prom because of covid or losing their graduation because of the protests like it's true it's true it's true. My bonus, my bonus son is graduating from college in a couple weeks. Yeah. And he didn't have a prom. He didn't have a graduation. None of that because of COVID. So thinking about that now too, is kind of like, think about how much life has either, has either been missed out on or that's, that's happened in a very haphazard way in the last four years without having, with them, without them having very little control over any of it. Yeah. As a, as a licensed therapist, do you feel like when you come, when you are talking to your clients and your patients about sort of the, the, the highs and lows, do you feel like people are honest or do you feel like people give you kind of the, the social media version of what, of what they think you want to hear? No, I'm lucky that I think they're very honest, but I think it's more so because of how I am. I think that the issue with some clinicians is like, I don't know. I, I, I've always felt like black people are very good. <laughs> and I would say people of color, people of the global majority are always very good at realizing when someone's not being real with you because we have to we we often have to mask so often for our safety and well-being that we can recognize when yeah. somebody is masking themselves and that doesn't mean if it's a clinician right. all sorts of stuff like that so i always feel like that's why we're very good at picking up on bs because we just be like yo i know you being fake because i've had to be fake at least eight hours of the day 
So like, I'm not right. about to tell my my feelings and stuff to somebody who's being fake, who act like they know what they, I'm talking about. They don't. I feel like that's it's just because right. how I am. Also, just being very Philly, like I grew up on food stamps, yo. Like so, like when it comes to like mental health stuff, I feel like it's not really possible to look at mental health outside of the social issues. So when I'm dealing with my mm. patients, I'm also bringing in the social issues, right? Because you can't outthink racism, right? So it's one thing right. to be depressed, but I'm like, all right, so you're depressed because of what's going on with you, and I'm not going to act like you're not also va- re- depressed because you're living in a world that invalidates your experience. You're worried about your safety. And sometimes with clinicians who don't practice with cultural humility, who don't have any sense, they really act like, you know, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are going to outrun racism. Like they really think you can only work with what's in their head and not take in the societal, what's happening right. in the world. Like why wouldn't I be hypervigilant as a black person? Like there's so many places where I'm unsafe. Why wouldn't I be uncomfortable or feel like I'm an imposter in an environment that's not welcoming? What, what kind of cognitive behavioral therapy is going to fix that? Yo, like, you know, like that's not, it's not a thing. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Because even when they talk about about substance use, I was on this panel. It's like an expert panel about suicide in a black community. And it's, I don't think many people realize the suicide in the black community has been increasing since 2019. And the biggest age group is yep. increasing is like age 13 to 25 or something like that. And one mm-hmm. of the experts in the room was like, you know, I think that it's hard to acknowledge the actual increase of suicide in the black community. Cause although it's increasing, it's even worse because you'll talk to people and they're, and they're getting in gangs for protection or they're engaging in really risky and dangerous behaviors. And you're asking them like, you know, do you care about your life? And they're like, no, but they don't see that as suicidal. But it is. Mm. So it's like, it's not really possible to get an accurate representation of suicidality in the Black community because I don't think that we're acknowledging the fact that the reason why there may be certain generations engaging in more risky behaviors is because they don't see a future for themselves. That's right. suicidality. That's suicide ideation. Oh, yeah, I'll get the gun and do it. Whatever. If I go out here, I might die. Whatever. That's suicidality. So it's not really possible to get accurate representation of suicidality in the black community because a big group of youth don't acknowledge that not caring about that, what's going to happen the next day, engaging in numbing behaviors, because a lot of people talk about fight or flight, but there's also freeze and freeze is like numbing Mm -hmm. behaviors, sexually risky behaviors, it's drag racing, it's doing drugs. That's, that's, that's happening as a result. It's, that's suicide ideation, but they don't see it that way. They just see it as like, you know, everybody around me is like that. Everybody around you got a, got a good justification of being suicidal too. I feel like it's not even, even though we see that the numbers are up, like black people in there and suicide alley is increasing. I think people would be just like, just, am- that just would be dumbfounded if they realized like these numbers are high, but they're not even as high as they should be. Because if you have conversations with people who think like, I don't know. I ain't got no reason to live. Like, yeah. What, I mean, what's the big thing? We'll break into this house and do something. If I die, I die. That's suicide ideation, yo. That's a lot of youth. Mm-hmm. And they don't even see it as suicidal. They just see it as like, it's just what it well, is. Well, it's normalized. Well, it's normalized. it's normalized. And also because, but also that's those, that, that symptom of depression too, where you don't, which I think still kind of links to, to suicide ideation is that concept of like, it's never going to get better. Yeah, like nothing is ever going to get easier. You're kind of stuck in this cyclical thing where you're in this. You're you're constantly just being invalidated. You're being de- de- demeaned. You're being belittled by by whoever. It could be by you know your teacher, or it could be by your parents, or or someone else in your family, or your friends, or just constantly having to prove prove your worth, prove your value. Yeah. Um. And I wonder if there's any way to kind of circumvent that as, as an artist, right. To kind of, to reach, to kind of reach around it, not, not avoid it altogether, but just kind of reach around it to touch the kids in a different way. that that kind of doesn't necessarily have to be an activism advocacy thing. Cause I, I, I find too, even in conversations I've had with, with family members of people, family members that are younger than me, there's very little, context or nuance or duality in the conversations with them everything is black and white it's yeah. like either 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 i'm gonna do this and this is this is who i'm gonna be or i'm not gonna do it at all and this is what it's gonna be but either way whatever the outcome is is not in my control and it's like no there's so much room for trial and error there's so much room and time and opportunity for you to experience something different and feel something different than just what you're used to i think yeah. i think everything has been so compounded into a short period of time. And, and again, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be the dead horse and go back to social media, but I feel like 
Mm-hmm. Social media has really made it difficult for for younger people to come to terms with what the possibility of reality is because they're removed from reality so often by being in their phones and their computers and their tablets all the time. Yeah, because so it's like, not they're, real. They're, it's not real. No, they're, they're stripping <laughs> themselves of that. They're stripping themselves of that interpersonal connection that allows your brain to function in a way that's not so linear. Like yeah. just on social media, just to scroll and seeing what exists and what what doesn't. It's like if it's not in your face on this screen, it doesn't exist or it's the likelihood of it being possible is small. And it's like, that's not how life works. It's just not no. how life works. And I think it's also like when I talk to my students and stuff and they're, they're talking about concerns about career and stuff like that. And I'm like, yo, careers are long and I'll be real with you. If I want to do something, I'm not doing it. You see what I'm saying? Like if I need to take a break, I'm taking it. And a lot of times people, my student was like, well, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. I said, girl, me neither. What the, who told you I know what you, I, I know what I want to do for the next six to nine months, but then I mean, I'm going to wait till I get to month seven to figure out if this is what I want to continue doing. I feel like mm-hmm. like that whole aspect of like black and white. And I think it's like a generational thing, too, because I, I can totally honor the generation that survives in their realm to like that was all they could do. But now we're in a generation where they're meant to thrive. Like, I always want to say, like, you, you, your protests helped me to be able to have like purple locks when I went for my Hopkins interview and still get the jobs. Right. Like your yeah. your sit ins very much made it so that I could tell my supervisor they didn't lost their freaking mind by telling me I couldn't specialize in black mental health. Right. Like. Right. And honor that. And we can also honor like y'all. Re- you, you need to learn that you need to learn, too, though, because that's not how everything operates mm-hmm. like that black and white thinking when it comes to activism. I think mu- music is activism, right? And there's so many times where students, they'll think that like, oh, well, I don't want to go into a, a, a march or a sit in I was like, what if I, t-? you know, art is active. There's artifice, right? What about, you know, activism? You're being an agent of change by just being yourself and being like, <laughs> being a person who is able to thrive in a, in a community that they never even expected you to, to grow in the first place. I feel like the limitations of that, also the aspect of social media, like it's very much a small subsector and i think too much is being expected of people like okay so it's not enough to be an artist you also need to be able to make money you also need to be an activist you also and an activism in this one very small realm and if i don't see you being an activist it didn't happen um if i'm a therapist not only do i have to actually be good off the company in my office but i also have to be able to show it well on social media and as well as you shouldn't be able to make any money right. because if you make money you're a monster and god forbid you're <laughs> god forbid you're god forbid you're neurodivergent and high functioning with stress and anxiety and you still have to present like everything's fine (laughs) everything's fine god forbid you like record something and be like no this sucks yeah end take or even decide that like i don't want to be on social media like it's just too much is being expected and i think it's absurd because i think it takes away their agency i always feel like when it comes to black people and, and and the aspect of what is detrimental to us. It's stuff that like attacks our black identity. And one of the things is that is lack of agency, right? Like when you feel powerlessness, Mm -hmm. when you feel like you don't think you're going to survive, that's what causes us to feel bad. But on social media, it's like, Oh, well you have to be shown in one specific way. There's some, like, even when we were, when you were mentioning, I was like, Oh, the whole, I listened to you for it right before this. And I was like, this is a lot. But the one thing I kept hearing, (laughs) I was like, yo, this is mad anti-black. Not going to lie. I think this. I think this song is very anti-black. <laughs> I'm just you gonna put that. You, wait, you think you for you think Euphoria is anti-black? I think Euphoria. There are some very many anti-black songs. Now, so, so for example, parts, okay. I don't say the N word. I I I, tr- I don't see how people do it. But like my dad uses the N word like as a punctuation mark. I kid you not. And like like kids, like I just be like dad. I like even when I be like you can't curse around the kids, and he said the N word. I'm like dad, that's a curse or yo like. You can't, you can't say that around the boys. I got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. He's good at it now, but as someone it's who some, like- It took some conditioning. Yeah, mm-hmm. as someone who don't even say the N-word, my dad, I grew up with someone who uses it as a punctuation mark, right? I always felt like if you are Black and you're having an experience, that is a Black experience, right? I see this aspect of consistently questioning- you know, whether someone is being voyeuristic with their black identity or stating that someone's mm-hmm. experience isn't black enough or, you know, people who state that they're pro-black, but really they're only pro-blackness that mirrors their own. I don't mm-hmm. like that, yo. Like, you know, like I, I, I can't stand that. So like when he was talking, when I think it was some lyric about like, I don't even like when you say the N word. Now, I don't know if I'm just now I'm like, neither do I. But when I listened to it again, I was like, hmm. I wonder if he's saying that because he doesn't see him as a, as a, as a black person because one of his parents isn't black. Right now, mind y'all listen to it once. So I'm like, you know, at this point I've seen think pieces on it. So I'm like, dang, I don't know. 
I think I got to listen to this five times and I won't because a six minute song, this is insane. <laughs> but like, I was just like, you know, I, I just, I, I find that people that are, that they mention aspects of being pro-black, a lot of times they're only pro-blackness that mirrors their own. Like for example, Amanda mm. Seals, Amanda Seals gets so much stuff. And the number of times I have heard people mention her skin complexion be as like as a way to discount like her yes, statements to, to or her education her. Yes. is insane, right? Yeah. Like so we can understand that there's diversity within the black experience. I'll have a different experience than the dark skinned black one would have thrown next to me because I'm a mom or because I'm a professor. But like it's when true. you when you decide to preface it with oh, that's just another light skin thing or dark skin thing. I've stopped listening because you've already put the same, like it's the same dehumanization that is placed on us by outsiders. I kind of feel like now we do it to ourselves. So when I heard it, I was like, a lot of this is anti-black. I, I, I saw some of the lines as anti-black because is it like, oh, he's not black enough. Oh, okay. Well, be, what do you mean? Which is, which, is, which is the age old conversation about the biracial experience and everybody yeah. the same way we could say, most most people's biracial experience is a is a biracial black experience, right? Yep. We don't experience colorism as as biracial people. We experience anti blackness. Mm -hmm. That's what we experience. It's not because to your point, when when that when the blackness gets called into question, then then there's this automatic defensiveness of trying to somehow verify and validate our blackness, which is still coming from the lens of white supremacy and how yep. we define blackness. Yep. So it's still. I agree with you. It's a little cringe. It's a little cringe. I think, I think the pointing out of that, just from knowing, knowing the full scope of the art of both artists very well, I think the pointing, the, the pointing that out was more to acknowledge to your point and to the point of, of what we've been talking about this whole conversation is the participation and contribution to socially active issues that are black. Yeah. And so it's, it actually has less to do with his mom being white and more to do with in what ways do you actually participate in this culture that you claim to represent and be a part of and reap the benefits of being in, adjacent to, right? Yeah. And so by calling that into question, I think is very different than questioning his blackness. I think the question is really how accusing him of cosplaying is very different than saying you're not black enough. I think questioning questioning the motives and the intentionality around how he participates in the culture is very different than saying you're not black enough to participate in the culture. But because we're now questioning some of the things, you know, Rick Ross had pointed out, well, he sent a cease and desist around a letter. There's certain things that culturally we now we will call out as Karen behavior. It's just Karen behavior. There's certain mm -hmm. things that you don't do that are morally centered in how we respond and treat each other as black people and people of color. Yeah. That to, that to me is kind of, if you violate those kinds of codes, then it doesn't call into question your blackness. It calls into question your loyalty and, and honorability in your blackness. And that to me is just a, it's a slight difference than saying that he's not black enough. Cause he's got a white mama. Like that's not J Cole got a white mama. You know what I'm saying? Like I have a okay, white mama. So okay. But here's the thing though. Okay. Okay. Which, which again is still very think, different. Do you think though, like the way you saw that, do you think everybody saw it that way? Or do you think there are a good set of no. people that are like, that's right, because his mom's not black. So he, like, do you, like, you know, like the way that you see that, right? The way you broke that down, do you think mm -hmm. that everyone who listened to it broke it down that way? Or there's a good chunk of people who also listen to it is just like, well, you know, he probably said that because one of his parents isn't black, right? Like, I can see what you're saying in that breakdown. But do you think everybody who listened to that broke it down that way? And, 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 no. and agreed on that realm? I, the, only, the only reason I, I say with Drake that, they, that it would be hard to miss is because of Drake's consistent collaboration with West Indian, Caribbean artists, and African artists, right? Yeah. I would say that, and, yeah. the, and, the, and the imitation of accents in the music. And, Yo, the imitation of you know accents what I'm saying? actually drives me freaking so, insane. <laughs> so, that, in that, so in that regard, like it's, it would be kind of hard to miss that point. But I do think that part of it too is he's Canadian. And so a lot of what we attribute hip hop to is the black American experience. Yeah. And so I think that that plays a part, unfortunately, because now we've, you know what I mean? Enter, enter all the xenophobes who are now talking about how black people in Canada don't have, you know what I mean? Where they're playing, everybody's, everybody's playing oppression Olympics automatically as soon as you say anything about black people yeah. in Canada versus yeah. black in America. But I think that that plays a role in it too, when 
entering into entering into a realm and an arena with other with other black artists and black hip hop acts that are telling their stories and speaking on their experience. It's kind of like to what we talked about earlier about the the soul of hip hop is in the relatability and the storytelling of your experience. And if you as a biracial man are speaking to a generation of young black kids or what, which again, if you go to a Drake concert, it's a mixed bag. Any of the biggest hip hop artists, it's a mixed bag. And so who they're speaking to, they don't have any control over that thing. I will, that I will say artists don't have any control over who their audience is. They can decide who they want to speak to, but they can't decide who's going to buy their tickets. I look, I think Lizzo is a perfect example of that. Lizzo is a big, beautiful, boisterous black woman. She is speaking to, she is giving space and creating space for more beautiful black women to be themselves unapologetically, very vocally with all their talent and all their grace. Mm -hmm. And yet we go to a concert and I looked around and I was like, it's a lot of middle-aged white women and gay, white gay men in here. It was not, it was not a lot of, and you can't choose that. You can't choose it. Cause I've gone to a bunch of Lupe concerts. And when I tell you there is not as many black people as I supposed to be, and I've only ever seen him in DC, it's not. I've only ever seen him in chocolate city, but I kid you not. Like every time I go to Lupe concerts, cause I'm a big Lupe fan. I'm like, the first time I went, I was like, yo, that's not, a, this isn't what I expected to see. And my husband was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. this is, his, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I expected to see. Now my husband's seen Lupe for forever, but like, you can't, you can't control it. I also, and you know what? This also came out when people, the first time people heard Idris Elba speak after seeing him in The Wire, because I remember there being a whole, and there's this other movie. There's this other- You could not tell me, you could not tell me Idris Elba was not from Baltimore. Yes. You could not. There's this other show. You could not tell me. Is it Snowfall? Probably with Damson Idris. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I remember having this conversation go around a lot because I can't remember the celebrity, but it was a big black actor, not big, like physically, but like he actually mentioned the fact that for American black American roles should only be given to black Americans. And I forget who it was. Cause I remember being surprised and being like, Whoa, I think a lot of people are actually going to listen to uh, that, but the, it was the same thing. Like with the meat, like the, when you said that about the Canadian experience, I was like, this reminds me of when a lot of people were like, so what you mean? Idris ain't what you, I went to it. I heard Idris yes. talk and I was like, yes. and people were pissed, yes. you know, like legit. And like that, and, and, and I was just like, hmm, it's interesting because people, I think people feel the same way about these, these, these roles. I just saw an argument. I forget, I forget somebody who posted it, but they had mentioned the fact that Ice Spice got a role and it was a pretty big role in a movie. And I was like, oh, okay. But I was surprised that there were so many comments and all the, were, a lot of the comments were actors and actors being like, I went to school for this. And we're at this place right. when you mentioned like social media where celebrity Mm-hmm. is going to like because it's about the money aspect we want somebody who's gonna put butts in the seats right like the aspect of celebrity is going to be more important than talent and then the thing is that that kind of irritated me about it was like i don't know what her acting talent is like we can't make an right. assumption about right. what her acting talent is and i can right. also acknowledge the fact that like we can also see all of these actors and actresses where we don't have to guess about whether they're good at it we know for a fact that they're good at it right so we're right. at this aspect with like social media. I think it happened with music because if you don't have a good tick, I saw some artists talking about like, if I don't have a good TikTok song, apparently that's all my record label cares about. And you have the aspect of the social comparison with social media, even in mental health. I will tell you there, there are mental health accounts that they are mental health advocates. They're not licensed mental health professionals. Somebody will listen to them before they listen to me because I only have like 350K on Instagram. They'll be like, well, I'm quoting this person. And I'm like, hey, I just want to just give a heads up because I know it looks like this is all, this is what I do, but like I actually I I teach not only full time as an HBCU, I also teach the clinicians. I train your clinicians. I also see patients. You can also look up my citation. I I, I know what I'm. I know I'm. I know they have a million followers. You're but qualified. Like, You're qualified. You're qualified. qualified. You're qualified. You're qualified. And I'll just You're be qualified. like the celebrity thing. I think I think people care more about the celebrity and the, the, and the power of celebrity than they do mm-hmm. about the, the, the quality of the content. Right. And so to your point, I really, I really do think that we might be asking too much of people. We might be asking I think we are to asking more. too much of people. <laughs> to a certain I think extent. we're asking artists to be, you know what I mean? It's like, we're asking, we're asking artists to be more than 
they're slated to be. Some really yeah. are only slated to be celebrities, and that's it. And that's all they have the bandwidth okay. for. <laughs> and that's okay. I think where it gets tricky is where people want to reap the benefits of, of the work they haven't done. And so Tell want to be in that. proximity. Tell me more about that. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Wanting to be, well, want, well, just feeling entitled and wanting to be in proximity to things, elements of the culture that are popular mm -hmm. that would serve them, but don't necessarily do the same, right? Mm -hmm. A great example of that for me would be watching Vice President Kamala Harris and doing a, a backyard barbecue cookout for hip hop's 50th anniversary. But then when it comes time to actually sit down and discuss policy as it affects black and brown communities on a federal level, but also even statewide possible solutions or strategies that could be applied, those conversations are slow to happen if they happen at all. And that to me gets, that gets tiring because then it just kind of feels like we're being pandered to and not, and not in a way, not even in an intelligent way either, just in a very like surface level, like stereotypical way of just like we're just we're just gonna have a cookout and that feels so i feel so it feels like you planted it, you planted it right face well you're planting right face and so i think artists have to be really mindful too not to get caught in that same trap and i think that's what kendrick is basically accusing drake of doing which is you are pandering to an audience that actually has a lived experience that looks like mine and you're pretending that it's yours when it's not yours and because you are such a, an unbelievable wordsmith and incredible with lyrics and you are a talented actor and you, you know what I mean? You can do all of these things. Yeah. You're also a little bit of a chameleon and a, being a, a jack of all trades, master of none is the counter to that. And so to be able to, unfortunately, it's the double edged sword of being a, a biracial person, being a racially ambiguous person, mm -hmm. we can fit into spaces that we may, that we may never belong to, which, which is, which puts additional pressure on us to constantly have to reinforce the things that we are and the things that we are not. Yeah. And whether that, and some of that is a, some of that can be associated with blackness and some of it isn't. Some of it is just to your point could be down to hair texture or, you know, the color of the, the color of our skin, whether or not our mother is white or black and we're biracial, right? Like all of those things I think still play a part, but I think we ask a lot of people to, when they show up as uh, to ask them to be their full selves at all times, be, be approachable, be vulnerable, be transparent while at the same time reckon with not ever being safe. That's a tall ask. And I, and I, I think ask. a lot of people don't even acknowledge the fact that like, it is a safety issue, right? Because one thing I always state when I'm like, people don't take like biases and racism and prejudice seriously enough, because what that does is severs the safety of an environment, right? Like bottom line, I'm unsafe mm -hmm. now. Like you, you race is like, oh, I'm unsafe because I don't, I don't know what that, where that's going to land. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, don't know where, I don't know where the line gets drawn if there, no. if, if racism is present. And then it's not even, it's and even in, and being that aspect, it's like, we want you to be transparent. We want you to share who you are. There's always, there's also this undertone of like, but who you are needs to fit mm -hmm. into what, who I think you like, what it should be. Like, it's, it's like, it's not, it's not accurate. Like, it's like, oh, we want you to share. I made this joke about my, when my students, I was like, you guys, they, they called one of my, my class, the students sassy because he said something, she said something crazy to him. And he said something back, owned it. And he, she was just like, oh, okay, sassy. And I said, oh, no, that wasn't sassy. You got That was a read. That was, you said something to him. And he said mm -hmm. something back. And I was like, y'all mentioned the fact that you want men to express themselves. But what y'all really mean is, I just want you to tell me how much you like me, yo. Like, when, when you say feelings, no, I, well, I mean, I just want you to tell me, like, how much you adore me. The feelings mm -hmm. need to be manifested in a certain way. So I feel it's the same way when people are like, oh, let me hear about your experience and let me hear about your identity and let me hear about this. And it's just like, oh, no, I didn't mean that. I meant like, this is what I, I assumed the picture was. So tell me about that. Like, what is it? What is it like? And it's like, that's not appropriate. I think we expect too much, but I think it's a hard, it's a hard line between like, as much as, as much as you have benefits, <sighs> Where's the line? Because at the end of the day, that person who say their mental health stuff will go farther than mine. And it's just like, you will reach more people. Right. I'm sure you didn't ask for this. And I need you to, it's like, it's like the difference between, 
I feel like an accomplished uh, and someone who's like a savior. Like I need someone who's going to fight with me, not like, you know, like, oh, you should do that. So it's like, if you have someone who you already know your voice is going to be heard better and it's already going to mm -hmm. be bigger. And I know it's a tall ask and I'm not saying do it all the time, but I'm saying there has to be some aspect of it. And if what you're and like the way you broke it down for me with like the, the Kendrick Lamar album, I don't think that's, I don't think that's a big ask because just like you mentioned it, there is so much benefit. There's, there's, there's so much benefit. Somebody will hear these people who, you know, like what they say about mental health way before they hear mine. And I'm like, so yeah. you got, I, I'm be real with you. You got to say the right thing. You got to say the right thing. Like you can't, if you're going to be heard more, what's the message that you're giving? Oh, just think positive thoughts. That's, you can't do that. Like there is a, there is a kind of a, no, no, sir. Yeah. No, ma'am, no ham, no turkey. You can't. No, I, I, I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. <laughs> you I think the two, the two, the two most important entry points, I think to have, to start having more of those conversations is one, the safety conversation. Mm -hmm. If that's the entry point off rip inquiring and asking how to, how, what makes you safe? What makes you feel safe? Yeah. That automatically brings somebody's defenses down off rip. And so once you bring someone's defenses down, you can start to actually have a have a dialogue that is meaningful beyond just what the intensity of the emotions are. Because I think everybody is everyone is feeling everything very intensely right now. Yeah. And most people don't have the words for it. They don't have the tools to kind of express where they're at with certain things. So I think leading with like, well, what makes you safe and what makes you you know what I mean? How do we how do we make sure we're all safe in this conversation? Right. Listening to that Shannon Sharp and Amanda Seals conversation, knowing what she had been yet. through. <laughs> it's so long. It's so long. And even when they I saw that she was going on the gas, show, they gaslit, they gaslit, they gaslit each other the entire time. Yeah, I was like, which this is really kind of like it was not it did not. It did both of them a disservice, in my opinion. It I don't did think everyone should interview everybody. I don't think everyone should interview everybody. And as someone who's still like, who's like, it's like, oh, I want everything to center the black experience and want to have conversations. I also think there are certain realms where I, I, I'm, I'm not in a space to have conversations with everyone. But I, even when I saw that they were having a conversation, I'm like, oh, this is very, this isn't equally yoked at all. You know, like, I don't think. I don't know how much, and I, I think that we were only as educated as the narratives that are shared. And I think that there are certain times where we are done a disservice because someone's star power allows them to get interviews where somebody else may ask better questions, right? Like I, I, I look at Francesca Ramsey and she talks a lot about like, to be a good host, you have to be able to say yes and. And there are so many questions yep. that we want answered and people... Mm -hmm. Like there are people whose emails, I, like I'll email people and I'll never get access. And I'm like, yo, you talk about black mental health. And like, I'm be real with you. I'm the best person to ask you questions about this. Now, other stuff, maybe not. But like, you'll, I'll see these big interviews and I'm like, this is not, I think we, certain people deserve better conversations because even with music, the one thing I will say about, even if I don't identify with all the music and even if I think it's too intense, it, the, one of the things that a lot of people get, like when my students were talking about is like this normalizing experience, I didn't think anybody else was having. Right. So you may not be able to actually meet that person, but you can watch that interview or you can listen to that track. Like yeah. the biggest difficulty with mental health is like there's not enough resources, but it's isolating to think you're the only person experiencing this. And I feel like we deserve better conversations. But some people have so much star power that like I think it's great you're at what you're doing, but everyone shouldn't interview everybody like because it's like I haven't seen it, but I saw some clips. And I was like, I don't like this. And I, every time I go to hit play, I'm like, I don't like this. <laughs> and I turn right. it off. And so, and so the second the second entry point for me, if safety is not the first entry point, then the second entry point for me needs to be, what does course correction look like for you? Yeah. Because I think we've conflated we've conflated accountability with reprimand, and it's it doesn't need to always be that. Yeah. And I think I think that converse we we gl we gloss over that conversation immediately by just deciding and disregarding somebody if we don't like them. And mm -hmm. that's not that's not how life works. That's not how society works. That's not you can't just completely decide somebody's experience and walk of life is completely irrelevant and 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 doesn't matter because it doesn't relate to you. Yeah. To your point, it's like everybody's experience, everyone's lived experience looks different. But what does course correction look like when an accountability look like when 
there are things that need to, because we have to create space for multiple truths to be, to, to coexist. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? And I feel like it, in that interview and in a lot of interviews I've seen with multiple people, there's just never any room for that to exist or for people to kind of make, go back and forth or have there be banter that's, that, that doesn't intellectualize everything, right? Yeah. For the sake, for the sake of sounding smart, but also still can kind of create small moments and small pockets of vulnerability and safety for people to say, I just, I don't know. I don't know what accountability looks like because I'm just really hurt right now. I would have loved if at any point in that interview, and I, I would love to get you, I would love to talk to you offline once you watch the interview. I would have loved at any point for Amanda to just to, sit, to stop the interview and just say, this is not a safe space for me. Like a lot of spaces have been unsafe for me and I don't have the tools outside of the defensiveness and the hurt that I've experienced to give you what you're asking for. Cause she's smart enough to arrive. She's smart enough to have arrived there. Yeah. So I think to, to stop, I would have stopped that interview. I would have not continued that interview. I would have, I would have said, Hey, I'm just continuing to feel unsafe here. And I, and it's a pattern that has made, has, has totally limited my ability to, to be self-aware enough in this space to actually acknowledge the ways in which I could probably do some things differently or approach some people differently and without, without invalidating anyone else's experience, without, without belittling her own experience and the own, and the, and her, and her own pain and, and, and discomfort that she's felt in a lot of spaces, black spaces for, uh, on top of that. Yeah. I just think we have, we have not, to your point, people, everybody doesn't need to interview everybody, but I think as human beings in general, in the talk space, none of us create enough grace. We're, we're, we're everybody's best judge and we're our own best attorney. We know how to defend ourselves against yeah. everything, but we don't know how to create room for anyone to discover for themselves what growth looks like for them or what that needs to be. And, and just I think be that's hard that is. because I think there are so many people who I think it goes back to like what you're mentioning about the aspect of celebrity and having to get a sound bite. And my, my business partner, Elijah, he mentions because I've been getting more interested in like in, in mental health of sports professionals because lately I'm like this is getting crazy oh. when they talk about people and he was like they need you they need yeah. you we all need you he was we like, all need you they I all said need all you. I'm watching is, is dehumanization and the objectifying of like people and when yeah. you're mentioning accountability like a lot of it's not even account like people want revenge like it's like a revenge thing and he mentioned he was like all of this change like a big change was when there was an increase in people just being able to get on a mic and like it, it didn't even used to be like the way that they talk to sports players and the way that they talk about these people and the, the way correspondents talk to people, like it's gotten worse. He's like, cause it, it mm -hmm. never used to be this bad. Oh yeah. Um, and when it, and when it comes down to it, I feel like people, I, I feel like not enough people live like a values based life. Like, okay. So I consider myself a scholar and like academic, but like in a certain extent, but I, I hold my value. One of my values is like the pursuit of information, like an intellect, mm -hmm. but that's not, my value is not in being right. Right. So like a lot of times I'll get and asked, those are, like, and those are two very those different, are two things. different things. And I think so many people hold value in being right. And I'm, and it's just like, Oh, you know, I'm really smart. So you know, I value being right. And I'm like, I also find myself to be intelligent and my, I don't value being right. It's one of the reasons why certain stuff is as simple as I'll be like, Oh, Oh, I got that wrong. Okay. And then, and I'm like, so you're going to help me or you, you going to be an ass or an assistant. You hear what I'm saying? Like, like what, what, what I, I don't mind. What are, <laughs> I mispronounce things. I would say often because a lot of times I read words that nobody ever says, you know, <laughs> and I remember <laughs> uh, mispronouncing something and it was like at a public thing. And I was like, and someone's like, oh, it's actually pronounced this way. And I was like, oh, thanks. I didn't know that. But at the end, when I got off stage, someone was like, oh my goodness, that was probably an uncomfortable moment. And I was like, what, what happened? And they were like, oh, when you mispronounced that thing. And I was like, whatever. Like, I didn't know how to pronounce it. I read words that nobody should ever have to say in life. And at the end of the day, all words are made up anyway. I know what the freak they meant. And I was, and they were like, that doesn't bother you. And I'm like, no, why would it? They, they helped me out. They told me the right pronunciation. Like it's, it's just getting stuff wrong. Even in parenting, my goal is to make a mistake in front of my child at least once a day. So they could normalize like mama made a mistake and she didn't pass out and have mm. a heart attack. She was just like, oh, grownups make mistakes too. If I do she something wrong, I apologize. Yeah. That's because the, that's where the, but I think so many people, they really think like, oh, I'm smart and I'm, and my value is in being right. But that's that's not the same as having value intellect. Like I'm always going to be a, a student. I'm like a professional student. 
so many people they just care about being right. I I've I've been on stage with someone and I misgendered them and I corrected myself, apologized for that, and went going forward. I didn't make it about me. I, I didn't crumble to the ground. I was like, I apologize for that. This is what I'm gonna do going forward, and then just carried it on. Like it's you make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. There's no way to not make mistakes. Yeah. But I think people are so afraid of doing that. That they just well like, because we, because we've we've can, we've made it unsafe for people to get things wrong. We've made it yeah. unsafe for people to make mistakes. We haven't we haven't we haven't really given people enough opportunity to get things wrong and then get things right. That's why I was like, yo, what does course correction look like? What does that? Yeah. What does making an adjustment for you look like? But you, someone has to be safe before you could even ask that. If someone's always operating from a place of like kill Bill, then <laughs> how are how are they ever going to have any any sort of opportunity to find out what actually works for them in a moment of like, okay, let me actually breathe and assess the situation without being distracted by the fact that somebody's trying to disqualify me again? Like, how do we, especially it's like when it's being to, recorded? Here's the thing, and this is one of the reasons why I, out that noise. It's like that you ugh. know it's going to be replayed. That you know it's going to be cut into clips. When I got yeah. asked one time, would I ever do like one of those shows where you're the clinician and you're doing therapy on stage or something like that? And I'm just like. I don't know if it's, I genuinely to this day, I don't know if it's possible to actually lean into the salience of therapy while being recorded because part of you is going to be hidden. Like, you know, this is going to be replayed. You know that someone yeah. is going to like tear this apart. People, I get asked about my husband all the time and I'm like, first of all, I don't need none of y'all telling my husband I need to talk to him nicer. You ain't never going to see this man. Okay, because when you let certain people in to certain aspects of your life, I'm like, mm -mm, I don't need y'all telling him that I need to be nicer to him. He's happy where he is. You will never see this man. You know, like, like, I did, I did. Yes. he's going to be safe. He's going to be safe over there. Y'all will never know him. You will never know. No, him. I, I never see my that. babies. It's. I think it's hard to even be in that aspect of vulnerability unless you're across from someone who you know is going to also know to like protect you and keep you safe in that realm when you're being recorded because you're it's not possible not to be aware of the cameras and the sound bites and the second guess yourself yeah. especially if you already second guess i always i always have hesitance with that i'm like i don't know the biggest thing about the i think one of the most amazing things about therapy is that it is behind closed doors i've had things that people have oh, told yeah. me in a session that they have not even told their parents or their partner or it took them a while to accept it and admit it to themselves and you're going to do that with something that you know that gets at least 10 million streams a day like, I don't even know if, if, if Shannon Sharp felt that certain way or if he felt like he had to ask it that way because that's where he gets his money. That's where he gets his money. He said that Cat Williams interview was more than he, <laughs> he made in like one round. So I'm always just like, I don't know. As someone who is still practicing, like I'm still a, a clinician, I don't know if it's possible to do that unless you're across from someone that you know is going to protect you and keep you safe in that realm, right? Like, unless you're across from yeah. someone who you know, and that's not going to be every interviewer. Like, it's not. Like, that's Definitely not, and not. that's also not where you're getting it from. I just don't think, it's like, okay, so say if I did that interview, because our, our last podcast episode is Amanda talking about being diagnosed with autism. And our, and I, the whole conversation, I'm like, how did you feel being diagnosed with that? What was that experience like for you? Like, it, that was, that was, that was it. Having that conversation, I included some more expertise and stuff like that. And I feel like if I, from the clips, even just looking at her face, I'm like, how oh, she does not look comfortable. Like, and I'm just like, what did I miss? And then I'm looking at the clips and I'm like, oh, every single clip I've seen is him being, I, I, I don't, I just, every time I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like it. And I've seen Shannon Sharp when he talks to, what's that guy's name? Ocho Cinco. They're clearly buddies. Yeah. Even their demeat, like even that, you can tell that they're both safe with each other because you you know, like, it's yeah. just like, I think interviews are, you're supposed to like have some aspect of safety. And yeah, like, just like you mentioned, like that was, and I also see how she, I always see like how she wants to, she wants to provide this aspect of like people. She understands her celebrity. So she's like, I want people to feel normalized. And like, I mentioned that this was my experience and I want to share that because I think people don't get access to that. But I also think sometimes I, I very much think like, you know, some spaces don't deserve you. Some spaces just don't deserve you. And it's okay to say that. Like, you know what? Just like you mentioned, like, I no longer feel safe. This this just, is not I'm a gonna, safe I'm gonna interview. Just exit. This doesn't, this just, this proves my point. Like at some point I was expecting her to be like, this entire exchange proves my point <laughs> about the fact that, 
like this entire exchange proves my point that that black spaces are not conditioned to create safety for me yeah or you know what i mean and i i mean I, that can be true i think i think that is i think that has been widely true I think the concept that somebody has to be likable in order to be successful, especially a black woman who is beyond qualified to have the conversations and occupy the spaces that she's occupied. Yeah. yeah. I think all of that, I think all of that is true. I also, I also do think that there is room for some more self-awareness work on that side. I, as far as the diagnosis goes, I haven't, I've seen a lot of mixed clips, so I don't, I don't want to necessarily, I don't want to speak ill-informed about what I've Someone said she wasn't. She wasn't actually medically diagnosed. She's self-diagnosed based on something. Some of the, some of the tests and stuff that she's seen online and different conversations she's had with professionals. But I do think that there is a. At some point, you have to prioritize your own safety and not do it in a way that that feels, not do it in a way that def, that that protects your ego, but actually protects the well-being of your soul and your spirit. And if that's what if that if that is what's front-facing then that's a lot that's a lot harder to fight against when try you know what i mean when try when when battling with yourself or with others about who deserves your empathy and sympathy and who doesn't mm -hmm. i think we create grace for the wrong things i think people ask for grace for the wrong things people ask for grace for their ego i'm not granting you grace for your ego i'm not granting you grace to be right in this moment i'm granting you grace to say i need to remove myself because i'm i'm disturb i'm emotionally dis this is emotionally disturbing for me and I'm having a hard time processing that. There's accountability in that. There's also a boundary in that. Mm -hmm. It makes it. It makes it makes it makes the the truth of the standpoint of where she is impenetrable. Yeah. Like who's going to argue? Who can feasibly argue with that at that point? When someone says this is a boundary that I just am not. And to your point, when the cameras are on, everybody's a different person. Mm -hmm. I did two seasons of Love and Hip Hop. The cameras went on. Every everything that might have been discussed off camera on the side could go totally left as soon as the cameras come on because now there is a there is a you, there is a, a a need for perform for performative behavior but then there's also a need for defensiveness and then there's also a need to protect the protect your ego and the presentation that you're making which i think in our industry becomes normalized that's more normalized than saying emotionally i'm not safe in this space and i'm just i'm gonna go home i'm gonna take my things and go yeah <laughs> just go I'm gonna go I think and it's not lot. respected it's not respected. J. Cole wasn't respected in saying, yo, I'm not, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Hey, this was not me. I, this is not who I am. I don't want to do this. I don't want to engage like this with y'all. Yeah. That wasn't respected. He prioritized not only his mental health, but also his emotional safety, mental safety and all of that. So again, we're asking men, we're asking men that, that we're supposed to revere in this space. We're asking them to be, to, to be vocal and say it with their chest. That man said, I'm out of here. I'm not safe. I'm not cool. I'm not comfortable with this. This is not who I am. Yeah. With his chest. And that still wasn't enough. I think people. So really we got to do better at making, we got to do better at figuring out wh what safety looks like and how to provide safety for each other. Cause that to me is the biggest misstep. I feel like if we can figure out and people can kind of custom, we can customize what safety is for every person that we are trying to respect and come and engage with. I think that's that's probably the first step to actually getting it right and not having to be right, but just like getting that part right. But yeah. safety is paramount. And that's going to start with people acknowledging that it's okay to change your mind. I, I very it's much okay think people are like, I, I saw that whole backlash with J. Cole and I'm like, all I see is somebody who said, I, I, I feel better looking at myself in the mirror. I care more about how I see myself than how y'all see me. That's all I saw. Like, imagine, mm -hmm. imagine. I remember thinking, like, imagine getting mad at somebody who was saying, like, I don't like this part of myself in this scenario, and I'm not going to do it anymore. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to engage like that. That's not. That doesn't. That doesn't. That doesn't feel like a. That doesn't feel like a good use of my power yeah. or my celebrity or my attention. It just doesn't feel like a good use of energy. Like, I remember being like, you can change your mind, y'all. It's, it's it's also okay for. And I think this is why. Once again, I think y'all more people need to be comfortable with making mistakes and like changing their mind. I have literally said like, I don't know enough about this topic to talk about it. Oh. <sighs> What do you? Mean? I just said it. I, I don't mean, know. You, I'm, you not, I'm, I'm not. I don't know enough. <laughs> yeah. I, don't know, I don't know enough about about a medical diagnosis yeah. of neurodivergence. I'm not. I'm not familiar with it, so I can't. I'm not going to say what's what's real and valid and what isn't. I can only say what I've seen. Yep. And what I've experienced personally. 
and not that's all have I can my give behind you. out here sounding like a moron. I'd be like, listen, that's you're not gonna you're not it's gonna so make cool. me feel bad for saying I didn't know something. I do not know enough about this topic to talk about it from a, a educated perspective. So I'm gonna come back when I do, or I might not come back at all because I honestly I don't know more about this topic. It's not I don't I don't particularly care. You know, like I do certain things. I'd be like, I don't I don't particularly care, yo. I'm I'm over here thinking about doctor's appointments. I haven't it's I haven't eaten. When is the last time I bought you know like I'm buying my kids new pants when I feel like I've been wearing the same jeans for years. I don't care about this. And it's okay to say that like or you know what I'm actually not an expert in this, but here are some resources for people who are people are so it's y'all just it's okay to not know everything. You're not supposed to, but you just or feel like you're going to miss out. Like, well, they're going to go to someone else. They should. You don't know what the freak you're talking about, yo. Why would they go to you? It's okay to say you don't know. I don't know. You think I should know that? I don't. People are people are afraid not to know. Mm-hmm. Or <laughs> people are. Well, I think it's one or the other. I think people are either afraid not to know or they're way too comfortable not knowing. And they're yeah. way too comfortable not knowing and spewing whatever comes to mind about it because... We just can. And that's the age that we're in. Right. Like I'm, I'm cringing. I'm going to watch it because I, I feel like I need to watch it. Cause I need to know what I need to know. What I'm going to message you after I watch it. Said. If it makes me mad, I'm going to be but, like, what the flip? <laughs> oh no, you're, no, you're going to be, you're going to be mad. You're absolutely going to be mad. Well, you're going to be mad. You're going to be mad from, from, a, from a clinical point of view, because there's just no way that you can watch this and not therapize the, the, the scenario. It's why I don't watch a lot of stuff. It's very hard. <laughs> like I'll watch, like I will literally like watch things and I'll just be like, I just, I just don't feel like this is productive. I feel like there's a better way to come at this. I feel like I can see it's cringy. when people start getting guarded and I'm like, you've complete, like I, can, I, I, like when I watch stuff, I was like, I can see the moment when you lose somebody. Like you may yeah. not see it because you continue to ask the question. I'm like, oh, you just lost the connection that you have with this person because I think that could have been said. It's hard for it's why I read more than anything. It's hard for me to watch stuff and be a normal person. I hate how much I think yeah. to y'all. It's exhausting, but I can't turn it on. Listen, <laughs> I I'm relieved. I'm relieved that the the part that the part of my the part the the season of my career of talking about some of these current event things is kind of over with because I, I feel like if, if, if my existence in this, in the talk space is only to report on the things and not necessarily provide any sort of different perspective on it, then I feel like I'm doing myself and my audience a disservice. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a strong enough opinion on something, or if I'm not, if I'm not picking a side, everything is about picking a side. Yeah. Like even down to the Amanda Seals discourse, I don't, I, I don't, I am on the side of all of the truths existing at once. I'm, I'm, that's the side that I'm on. I'm on the side of yes, black media outlets have absolutely been nasty to that woman and she deserves better. I'm on the side of yes, she absolutely deserves to have a space and a seat at the table because of the amount of information and the amount of advocacy, passionate advocacy and information that she spreads on a daily basis for black people. Mm-hmm. There's a need for that. I'm also on the side of she's probably been really atrocious to certain people. And there's, there may be, whether it's neurodivergence or not, there may, there may be a need for some of that introspection in order to get that, that, that aspect of some of these people's experiences, right. To remedy some of that, there's room for all of those things to exist at at once. And I think media it's media has, especially black media, unfortunately has, decided that the sweet spot is to be in that divisive space where it's either one or the other. We're either team Kendrick or we're team Drake. We're yeah. either, you know, we're team, we're, we're team this person or team that we got to be. And it's just not, it's, it's so beneath what I think media outlets are capable of, especially considering a lot of people that I know personally that work in media have journalism degrees. Yeah. So we're not, we're not, we're not just dealing with people that, are bloggers or started a blog or got famous on Twitter. We're talking about people that really study this. We're talking about people to your point, like yourself who are infinitely curious about obtaining information and being able to share that the right through the proper channels and do it in a way that is still enticing to across generations, whether it's a kid in high school who maybe doesn't, who doesn't necessarily have the attention span, but will try yeah. Or somebody that's that's stuck in their ways that's a little bit older. Like all of that stuff to me is like, wow. It's 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 a little bit, I think we're we are all granted an opportunity to expand 
and go wider instead of deeper. I don't think I don't think any any other media outlet needs to try to go deep with conversations. No interviewer needs to be going deep. I'm gonna watch the drink champs. I'm gonna watch I'm gonna watch the Eric Adams drink champs interview because he's always outside. He's everywhere but where he needs to be, is in my opinion, <laughs> being a New Yorker. So doing interviews like your boy is on a press front. He's on a promo tour. He's you know what I mean. Like he's at the family reunions. I he's doing he's doing all of that. Everywhere while, but while where he needs to be. I legit everywhere I but where not. he needs to be. I think I'm gonna be hearing that all day. Like yo yo, what are we? So so I'm gonna watch it because I think it's I do think it's important to be in the know about what's being said. Yeah, but. I also am am relieved that we I, I would I'm going to continue to implore media media outlets and personalities that I know personally to create space for for less depth because we don't need to keep going deep 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 the deeper we go the more we end up talking in circles. If I'm we saying and, wider, and losing people because like it's like you guys are going people. deep and pe- nobody's ready like you know like this is like, you guys are going to level twenty we still got people at level one like why are we we can't keep you. Lo- no, no. <laughs> we, need to, we, need to, we, need to, we need to go wide instead of going deep. We need to, we need to, we need to, we can, we can afford to keep things a little surface for the sake of emotional safety, for the sake of preservation of, of information, ac- accurate information, right? We can try to minimize some of the manipulation of, of information and facts that goes on. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that's, that's, that's my new found, that's my lane. That's where I'm pivoting from outside of podcasting. Now I'm hosting and doing all that kind of stuff, but I think anything else I'm going to do in the, in the talk space would be like this, where it's like, well, how can we, how do we reach, how do we reach more people in a more meaningful way? Or maybe not even more people. How do we reach the people that we just have access to in this small pool appropriately so that everybody feels enriched in some kind of way? I love that. Well, if we're talking about being in lanes, tell everybody where they can find you. Tell them like with any yes. upcoming projects and, and tell everyone where they can find you as well. Cause I yes. know you're going to be in Nashville because you're hosting. I am going to be in Nashville. I'm very excited about that. June 13th through the 16th. I'm going to be in Nashville hosting the Blavity house party music festival, which is going to be off the chain. I mean, it's, and I, I say off the chain because it makes me feel old, but it's Drew Hill. It's Ryan <laughs> Leslie. It's Monica. It's Freeway. It's Lil Wayne. It's Blast. It's Victoria Monet. I, I mean, who else? I feel like I'm leaving a bunch of people out. Shensia, Uncle Waffles. There's going to be so many incredible artists and acts that are taking this over. And I'm really excited to be hosting it. It's myself along with Zach Fox, who's also an incredible comedian. I don't know if you all are familiar with Abbott. If you watch Abbott Elementary, then you mm-hmm. would have seen him. He plays yeah. Tariq. He plays Tariq on Elementary. He's brilliant. But so he and I are hosting that. And then I'll be at Essence Festival. I'm going to, I have to, I have to give the full scope, but I will be in New Orleans for Essence Festival in the convention center with Coca-Cola. So that's going to be really exciting. All, all three days. And for Better or Best Podcasts, I'm producing that show. Charles Kirk, Charles and Shereen Kirkendall, they're in an, they're in an unbelievable couple that is they're tech entrepreneurs they are on black they were on black love they are talking about friendship entrepreneurship marriage family balance all the things trying to have all of the things while also still keeping god first (laughs) trying to love each other not kill each other and and continue to expand their empire and so that that actually is a weekly weekly podcast they drop every wednesday so definitely tune into that it's called for better or best podcast and follow me at i am bridget kelly everywhere on twitter and on instagram i'm not on tiktok i just i i just i won't I won't subject myself to the rabbit it's holes really that I would necessary. end up down. Yeah. Right? Like I just, know, I just know myself. I know myself. I know myself. If I go on TikTok, I will be there all day, completely immersed in DIY type of projects for my house. I don't need it. I don't need it. So yeah, my mom is on TikTok me. now, but it's only because she, to follow me. But like, yes, she, I'll, I, she'll be doing new recipes and new books. Yeah. And I'm like, where do you find out about this TikTok? And I'm like, okay. Mind you, I had to force her to be on there because she's like, oh, your aunt told me you posted this video. How come you didn't send it to me? I'm like, because it's on, it's on, I'm not going to send you social media videos, mom. That, that's why they're on social media. I'm not going to, re- just, 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 just follow just me. Follow you me. just got to follow me, mommy. Just you don't have to follow me. anybody else. And now she does. And she's like, yeah, I got this new recipe off of TikTok. I'm sure you did, girl. And it was delicious. Good for her. Yeah. Right? I'm like, mommy, I told you you would her. like it. Just listen to me. Like, raising your parents is hard, you know? Like, she swears she's grown. Oh. But that like... is another episode in itself. We, that is another episode in itself. It's, it's very it's, interesting. Just, my mother my mother just decided to go to therapy this year. This yeah. is, she is, this is, 
she's done it. She's she's done like she's done it in spurts when there's been like some traumatic losses when are you know dealing with grief or that kind of thing. But it was like a burst and then stop. So this is the first time where she is going on a weekly basis and it's turning out to be. It's, I have not. I'm gonna. I've I've spared her from the I told you so conversation. I'm just really happy <laughs> and pleased and grateful that she found her way. Because it's been incredibly, it's been incredibly helpful. So I, yeah, I, parenting, parenting your parents is definitely, it's definitely a theme right they now. They swear they grow. Definitely I just be right like, now. just do what I tell you, honey. Like, <laughs> just trust me. Just trust me. I got it. I got it. Whatever it is, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, come on. But yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for coming on the show. And I'm supposed to Oh no, that's Martin. Nashville. Thank you for having me. Of course. Oh yeah. No, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have brunch. We're gonna have brunch in Nashville. Yes. You're gonna yes. have to let me know where the where the where the good food is in Nashville, and we're gonna have to go to brunch. Mm. It's gonna go down. Good luck with that, because the best food I have is at somebody's <gasps> house, my husband's family's house. Um, I don't. And you know, my mom always says this because I'm from Philly, and I'm so used to small businesses food. and food like I never really even ate at like conglomerates like that like I had my first pizza hut when I moved down here because I'm like pizza hut what the flip there are pizza spots you know what I'm saying so like she says it's just and it's not I, I, I and plus my husband's whole family is here and they can cook oh they can oh yeah cook. so you don't have you never have to yeah see and that's so how when I, I go out I'll be like here. yep my mother-in-law made better fried chicken mm. and this is terrible you know so I just be like this is you know, can't do it. Like, I can't, can't do, do it. it. And I think one of the reasons why some people like, oh, this food is good is because a lot of people, I, I think a, a good chunk of people in Nashville don't cook. So they don't no, know I would that this so. was poorly seasoned. Like, right. no. So I'll look, I'll start, Poor listen, people. I'll start doing research now. So then maybe I can have a good place okay. by okay. June because. I'll check, I'll check and see what the Yelp reviews are looking like too. Hopefully people are honest. Ask people else that, that are here. Because people, because people lie. People and they lie. also, they don't know good food. That's what I'm saying. They were like, all oh, these people lie in the reviews. They're like, oh my God, this was the best, uh, best casserole I've ever had. And I'm just like, Not casserole? You went casserole. to a restaurant for casserole? Why would you go to a restaurant for casserole? Like, that's your that's your review? Like, I'm supposed to try this restaurant based on casserole? No shot. I went to a so, whole restaurant yeah. that had really good reviews. And when they food, the food got to me, the plate was piping hot because it just came out the microwave. It wasn't the food that was hot. The plate was hot. And I was like, now someone who doesn't cook wouldn't know why it's like oh this plate is hot you just brought me this out the microwave only thing that needs to be mm. hot is my food like and i was just like mm, these are reheated waffles wow in the microwave i'm telling you if the pancakes don't taste like butter or nothing that means they're from a box okay as someone who so makes maybe, stuff maybe, scratch, we should, maybe we should opt for a happy hour moment instead maybe, of brunch just saying, now I now all i'm gonna think of you. is a microwaved waffle now listen That's you come you come up with vip so like maybe they maybe they have maybe they know people here and they're like okay so we we got they the might. intel they might. tell them to i'm gonna ask Yes, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask. I think, okay. yeah, I think, I think one of the one, a couple of the execs know Nashville very well, so I think okay. we'll figure out. And plus, you know, I'm a mom of two toddlers, so I don't, I don't, I know the good parks. Um, I know when Costco has a great sale. You know, like I don't, I, I'm not in the phase of being a real human. That's yet. fine. We could go hang out at Sky Zone. It's all good with me. <laughs> no, 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 we're not. Bringing, we're not bringing them, Bridget. No, 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 no. You just gonna have to imagine that. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. No, oh my God. Yo, that is I, so I love funny. that you I'm were definitely... so open for that, but absolutely not. I, and I love I'm that. The, I love the... that. I'm the friend that's like, girl, if you got to bring the kids, bring the kids. And every friend that I have that's got kids is like, girl, no, when they're not coming, we're leaving them. And I'm like, I don't ever have to bring them. They dad is right here, honey. Absolutely not. But thank you for making that open. But that door is shut. But I, I, no, Mm -mm. just in case, worst case scenario, in case of emergency, Mm -mm. ain't no kind of of emergency I have to bring my kids when I, when I I live in this house with my husband. Okay. And and if that emergency don't exist. (laughs) <laughs> okay the, the, like, emer- the emergency the emergency is that there's a happy hour that's down the street that we got to go to and the kids will stay at home yeah don't even ask where you going huh what you what you asking i'm me? out the kids yeah what, I'm you out. Got, did you need something did you have a question bye <sighs> say what they did Mm-mm. i don't even call but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, we are gonna have a good old time next yes. month when i get there it's gonna be a lot of fun thank you so much for this this was so great and awesome. so and just so just so thoughtful i just love it i love it thank I you so much it. 